Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. On today's program again next week, we're going to be talking about art, and we have a great artist with us. I would actually like to say that it's a discussion with one of the Northwest's most prominent artists. It's very special to me because he's been a friend for a very long time and such a wonderful human being. I welcome to the program Harold Blaze, and many of you have seen his work throughout the Northwest, and we'll be showing a few slides of his work uh, as we do these two programs. Harold, I've always admired your work so much, and one year when we were doing the Popcorn Forum uh, lecture series on the First Amendment, you did an incredible poster for us, and announcing it and saying censored and and that was so great. And so welcome to today's program again next week. Your work is just so admired by so many. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. Beats working for a living. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you do great work. And I'm so pleased to have our regular panelist, but Janelle Burke, who's an attorney in the state of Idaho. And today I'm welcoming a very dear friend who's the program, and that is on the panel is Sue Flamia. And she's a great patriot of the arts. In fact, she and her late spouse, Patrick, and, and a few others really started what all of you know about, and that's uh, Art on the Green, and uh, Sue has just turned out to be one of the greatest things in the Northwest, and you would be so commended for your work thank you, Tony. for many, many years now. And so thank you very much. Thank you for being here today. It's a pleasure. And with that, I'll ask Janelle to start today's question. Welcome, Harold, to the program. It's going to be fun today to talk about art, but before we begin to talk about the art, let's talk a little bit about you and your background and, <laughs> and your training in the art. Um, I know you're kind of an artist artist, and it's so... I don't know why I come about. up with, people come up with that all the time, <laughs> <laughs> which is sort of an honor. Um, yeah, I grew up in the rural Midwest, uh, just outside of Cleveland, and my father was in the sheet metal and air conditioning business, and my mother's side of the family were involved with Baldwin Wallace College and Oberlin and all of that. And uh, she had quite an interest in that. So she started taking a group of us into the Cleveland Art Museum for Saturday class, Saturday morning classes. And, um, which really made a mark on me. And uh, then, you know, you just fumble through life, played football, basketball, and all that stuff. <laughs> Uh, I, my first year in college was at a junior college in Chicago, where I actually I was studying mathematics, and, and I wanted to be a aeronautical engineer. I was, I was dreaming of. I, I grew up late in the Cleveland, of course, and the air races were always held there. And one of the pylons for the Thompson Trophy races so was in my grandfather's pasture, so we, I just loved airplanes. But anyway, um, while in college, I had a, a an epiphany, I guess. I got in a fist fight with my math teacher. They threw me out of class, and I had to pick up another, another four-hour class. So I went in and uh, took a life drawing class. And that, that I'd always drawn, uh, made model airplanes, and was always fussing around making stuff. You know, and, uh, then uh, my parents moved uh, west in about 47, 46. They graduated from high school, 46. And then uh, I came out and enrolled at La Zoo and then uh, pursued a BA there and graduated in 51. And my wife and I were so naive, Rosemary, we got married in 50, and uh, uh, she became heavy with a child right off the bat, and we uh, didn't know you couldn't just go make your living right off the bat in there, well, but that's what we tried to do. While we were still in college, I was making uh, artsy crafts and stuff, little jewelry and trinketry that we sold to Joel, a uh, gift shop in Spokane, and we became fast friends. And, uh, he, uh, of course, everything was in consignment in those days, it still is for the most part. And, um, we ate mostly because Joel would advance us <laughs> three dollars on weekends. <laughs> and then we tried to run a gallery, and uh, that wasn't very successful. But somewhere along the line, I took up skiing, and this 
surreptitiously raided, uh, started, I uh, took up with the architects who were all steers. And that, they came out of the Bauhaus movement, uh, these architects, some of their teachers had actually been Bauhaus people. And I had a Bauhaus teacher, and uh, there was that art and architecture collaboration thing in the works about that. It was just getting started. And so, um, and making doors, making baptism fonts, baptistry gates, and that kind of stuff. And just kept going. And of course, in those days, uh, part of the gaining a reputation was to uh, enter the work in galleries, uh, mostly in museum shows, which was very. And I wasn't, I could see very, right off the bat, this is going to work. You know, you box this thing up and ship it somewhere, and then somebody tells you it wasn't acceptable. And, there was no money in working that way, so I just avoided that for a while and started. We made, uh, what was it, 54, 55, somewhere around Pat, uh, Sue's husband, and I got together and started for about two years. We made little arts and crafts and stuff, wrought iron candlestick holders and ashtrays and crazy little stuff like that. And then we went our separate ways. And uh, Pat always told me something. And, uh, that I never paid attention to, or I, I think I would have been successful earlier. He said, uh, as long as the orders drawer is full, keep raising the price. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never <laughs> took that to heart. <laughs> <laughs> and Pat uh, got me interested in opera and harmony and grits. I've never eaten grits until that. <laughs> but opera was. Great contribution to my background. Thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> well <clears throat> one of the things uh, we've all been so uh, interested in as we've uh, known you over the years and had a chance to see the beautiful work you do is your wide range of materials. And uh, I wondered, are there certain materials you particularly like to work with, and uh, what are they? And and why? Well, I think part of that, is, I'm just eclectic in nature. I just sort of interested in everything, and I've done a lot of reading. And But I think living in a small community, it, it, it's almost impossible to specialize. I, mean, I remember once doing a workshop in Alaska, and there was this watercolor who lived in a town of 40 people. Well, everybody bought one of her paintings in town, and now what is he going to do? <laughs> well, now you're going to have to start making bronze sculptures or quilts or something. You know? So, yeah, you just sort of kept the door open for anything that walked in. If somebody wanted a door for something, you went out and learned how to make a door. And, uh, and I, one of the things, uh, a lot of people say I'm not an artist, uh, in the larger picture of what art world is, and they, they call me a craftsman because I do stop and make people's house numbers. And uh, I think the usual route was to get a job teaching, mm -hmm. which uh, any of you have taught, I know that just saps this thing. And uh, you'd never get around to doing your own thing. Well, by doing things that wouldn't normally appeal to me as art objects, uh, making a nice cup or a table or a uh, coffee table or blanket chest. Uh, it expanded my range of materials I could work in and the skills I had to develop to uh, do those various things. The, the, the drawback was that I ended up having to acquire so many tools that I couldn't profitably operate them all. <laughs> Anytime I was working on concrete, here were tools for woodworking, metalworking, and it's sitting idle, not <laughs> returning their investment. So, um, but I, I, I look at Steve Adams, who's a great friend of mine, a glass blower, and one of the best in the area. Uh, I always accuse him of being simple-minded, because I, couldn't, I can't see how you could possibly just spend your whole life doing one thing like that. But, um, it's, it's just the way I chose to operate. You know. But of those materials, you know, uh, 
you do a lot of work with copper. And and that's one of your, your signature yeah. skills. And the stainless steel. You do a lot of beautiful yeah. work with the stainless steel. Well, there's just something... Uh, for the centuries, the sculpture was taking something, a you know, block of rock or a piece of wood, and cutting away everything that didn't look like a giraffe or whatever it was you were trying to do. And uh, you know, the clay people could make things. But if you wanted to make something out of metal, you had to have a cast. And that's a very, very expensive procedure. And my dad, in the sheet metal business, I learned how to develop uh, form from a flat surface. A, a, a most metal behaves just a, exactly like a sheet of paper. And you start playing with a sheet of paper, and it can do all sorts of things if you want. And then if you cut this in half, you get other things and so on. So, uh, and then plus the fact you were having to skip these things to show that they would be very expensive. So that was just self-defense, you'd making things out of metal. Copper was a metal of choice simply because it was easier to, easier to fabricate than other metals. Um, my second favorite thing, I think, would have to be enameling, which is uh, colored, colored glass fused to metal. It's a centuries-old technique. It's known as stampone and uh, cloisonne. It's only in, one of those big for centuries. And then, uh, of course, concrete. Uh, it, 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 concrete is the most used substance in the world, next to water. And um, it's very easy to form. Um, and I sort of, when styrofoam came out, I was one of the first people to start monkeying around making forms out of styrofoam. And of course, because I do one of the kind things, uh, that was fine. If I wanted to do multiples, that involved other uh, means of working. But uh, uh, I have yet to try, and I still, I, it's available out there, is the concrete that will cure at freezing temperatures. And, to be able to make your molds out of snow, I think it's just <laughs> something I want to really try yet before I... have <laughs> got new ideas. Yeah. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, for you who are not familiar with uh, our wonderful guest, he has done some wonderful artwork for North Carolina College, and one of those was in memory of uh, one of our faculty members, a wonderful man named Jack Steve, and in honoring him, Harold did this piece, and we're going to put it up, and it's... Uh, here it is right here now, and Harold, you might describe this. Well, my work is not describable. <laughs> um, it, it, it is oriented. Um, Jack was a great favorite of mm -hmm. And it's oriented on uh, what would be a call a beat to the prevailing wind. This is being the prevailing wind, and this. This, 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 this is prevailing, and this is at an angle. There's some hidden significance. To that. And you see that here in this. <laughs> yeah, and then the idea of uh, uh, luffing sails and all that stuff. Is, it, is this concrete here? Uh, no, that's copper. That's copper. Okay. And I, Jack was, you know, a crazy personality. And if there's anything that prevails in my work, it's uh, the idea that. Uh, the juxtaposition of dissimilar objects. I just think the world's a very complex place and we just keep... I like to just jam things into a context that doesn't make sense. And uh, in doing those works... Um, For our viewers who might be visiting our campus, this particular art piece is located just uh, on the grounds just outside of the Headland building yeah. on campus and under the beautiful pines there. Next week, we're going to show another work that you did in, in honor of our wonderful, wonderful friend, uh, Pat, uh, or Patrick Flanius, who's uh, late husband, and it, it's also just breathtaking. And I'm going to go back to the panel, but I also want to say that Sue Flanius, in addition to being this incredible supporter of the arts, is also an attorney like Janelle, and has practiced with great uh, prestige and, and honor in our community for a long time. And with that, I'll go back to Janelle Burke. Thank you, Tony. Um, your work it can be described as being clever. Can <laughs> well, be thank you. No one ever described it. <laughs> it can be described as being creative. 
Um, it, it, it has a great curiosity about it. Uh, anyone who looks at it thinks uh, about it. How do you come up with these ideas? Well, um, it, you, know, you all have epiphanies. And I remember in my art history book, uh, looking at something in China, and it was two rows of, and they, they did this often in landscaping, and it would be gigantic, 15, 20 foot high animals, and griffins and uh, fictitious animals, you know, and just this mile long room, and there's a point there, if you look at, all of a sudden, you can no longer identify the animals. Yeah, but the, the ones that get past that point still have a very dynamic outline. Mm -hmm. it, it is silhouette. And then that was one of the most important lessons I got in college from a, one teacher just pointed out, it's that initial silhouette that just grabs you. And um, so I finally decided that it's much easier to make a incredibly interesting silhouette out of something non-objective or it has no reference to me. And I have finally come, although I do some representative work, but mostly of late, I'm just not into it. That is uh, replicating the known visual world. And um, I think, and then, along with that, there was a nun down in the Holy Names College in Los Angeles who had the notion that uh, the world's never going to starve for wonder, only the lack of wonder. And that made a really big, so since that time, mostly I just tried to create wonder. And if it represents to you or anybody else something else, it's not a prerequisite for me. I see no, I don't see any sense in making lines on paper to replicate something that already exists. <laughs> Why bother with that? That just doesn't interest me. Except, every then, no, then you need to show off. <laughs> and show that you can still draw a cabbage very nicely. There's a difference between rendering and drawing. Drawing, I say, is that activity that produces an image that has the right to exist. Conviction, authority, presence, whatever. But it doesn't have to represent something from the whole world. And to me, it's, it's easier, in that Jack Steele piece, to make something exciting and interesting by not trying to make it look like a beaver. N not that I'm opposed to making beavers and nooses. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a, it doesn't interest me. It's just my way of creating wonder, which I think, to me, is my role right now. And then you pointed out clever. I, uh, somebody came to one of my shows and he said, the, how did he put it now? The, the, the ingenuity of these devices uh, disguises their utter uselessness. And I said, wow, you did it. And you said, clever. I, I just love to be clever. Um, it, it's a little like, you know, I like, Paganini was such a virtuoso, you know, and I, uh, I think every now and then a visual artist has to do something that's just a show-off piece. Look, I can hammer metal into a, ca is that you can't tell this cabbage from a real one ten feet away, you know, I say, so, and I don't know what that's about, you know, I guess, you know, <laughs> so, you know. Oh, thank you. I want to go back to this creating wonder, Harold. You have been so generous with our community, and you've worked on so many wonderful projects with us over here. And this creating wonder makes me think about the project over at the um, uh, Harding yeah, Family yeah, Head Start. Yeah. So would you talk a little bit about that and how it came to be? And uh, uh, Well, you're the reason it came to be. You well, know, yeah, better than I. <laughs> Um, Who has a track record that <laughs> of art all over the community? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks to him. Yeah. Well, well, you too. Well, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there, uh, I, I just read a book by Jacques Barzun. Have you ever read any of his work? Mm -hmm. He's a minister of culture in France for years, and he's quite an essayist. And I've read a lot of stuff over the years of his, and 
he talked, it was written a new book called um, uh, Dawn to Decadence. It's from about 14th century, the printing press, to uh, contemporary time, but it's mostly to do with Western civilization. I felt that. But he says, because of democracy, uh, what we want to believe in, <laughs> we really, and women's lib and women's rights and other people's rights, it, it, it's foolish to go around saying that what you make is better than what you make, and what you make is better than she makes, and what I make is better than all of you. you know, that, that has been what criticism has done ever since Louis XIV. Um, that's that old business in opera. If you wanted an opera to play in France, you had to have a dancer. You had to have a ballet, or you didn't play in uh, France. And these were people who didn't knew nothing about art, but were the little people who fluttered around the edges <laughs> of the court. Uh, they decided, thought they yeah, they thought, well, this is what makes that opera good. And so if you wanted to have an opera, you had to put one of that in to please uh, Lord somebody. And he says, now we've reached a time where it, it is sort of foolish to say that good, better, and best. It's, it's, uh, the criticism is not to establish who is good, better, and best, but to uh, initiate thought and excitement and ideas. And one of the things that has really intrigued me for centuries has been uh, a folk art. And um, it seems like the Watts Towers down in California, which most people are familiar with. And I have a book of stuff like this that's gone all over the world. It, 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 that, 